mechanism is, in a zoom mechanism, is this concave piece moves back and forth. Okay? And then the focusing element, the very last one, it actually moves back and forth a little bit too to focus different parts of the scene. So that previous one was actually um, in the wide angle position, which means that it was not zooming in on something. If you have a look at this one, however, we've moved this concave element close to the front, which means our light is getting spread out right away. We're even losing some of it right here. Okay, So we're actually going to capture less of our scene, but we're going to capture less of that scene on the exact same size of sensor, which means we're actually going to be blowing up and making it bigger. So to zoom, this element just moves back and forth. Okay, And to focus... <coughs> excuse me, that final convex lens moves back and forth a little bit. Now here's inside an actual video camera lens. It's much more complex than our simple example. You'll actually see there are 11 lens elements here. We've got a con uh, convex one here at the front, and then sort of half a convex one, and all sorts of different shapes in here. But one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So we've got a lot of different lens elements in there to help in focusing that light and to give us a good zoom range and actually to help other little things happening in the camera that we won't discuss in this basic uh, lecture. Now at the very end of the lens is an opening. There has to be, otherwise the light can't get into the camera. Okay? That opening is called the aperture. And we're actually looking down the front of a lens towards the back here. And you'll see this is quite a small aperture. The aperture is the opening. Now the thing that actually sizes that opening, these little metal leaves around here, that's actually called the iris or the diaphragm. And that's the thing that you're going to adjust to change the amount of light coming in or out of the camera. Now this one's quite small, which either means that there might be a lot of light out there and we're exposing properly, or it could mean that we are underexposed. Okay, so we wouldn't know that unless we were actually looking through the camera. But uh, that's your aperture. And finally, we're out of the lens and heading into our next area of the camera, which is where our prism block and our sensors are. Now remember that light can be broken up into its components. Okay. And prisms are very good at doing that. You might have owned one when you were younger. I can remember a friend buying one at the Ontario Science Centre once, and I was envious for the rest of the day. But like I said, you know, if you've got some, some glassware or maybe a little ornament with facets, or a lady's diamond ring will often have all these facets that will break up the light, cause all sorts of internal reflections, and out comes a rainbow of sorts. Okay, So we're actually going to use this property of light inside our camera. So we've got our light focused and it's coming into the camera now and we're going to split it up. Okay, Now we're actually going to use what's called a prism block here which is three different prisms. Okay, And they're all stuck together and the angles are such that they affect certain wavelengths of light. Okay, So you'll see here We've got our rainbow of light coming in. Now, really, you should think of that as white light. It's not a rainbow coming in, okay? But white light is made up of all those colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Okay, maybe you memorized Roy G. Biv when you were younger, or Richard of York goes into battle valiantly, okay? Um, as it comes in here, it hits the first surface. Now, this surface is actually treated to help it out, but because of the angle that it hits at, it's actually going to reflect the blue light back. Okay, The blue light comes back, hits the back, and then comes out the one side. The rest of the light continues through. And then when it gets to the next, uh, the next switch between one prism and the other, the red light can't make it through. It gets reflected back, hits the back, again gets reflected, and out it goes. Now, when it comes out, it's basically at a straight line, you'll notice, to the prism, because all of this stuff happens with angles. So if it hits at 90 degrees, there's really nothing to bend. 
So that's why you'll see these things coming out at 90 degrees. And finally, our green light actually gets all the way through. Okay, now you're going to find that on each of these places where the light comes out, camera manufacturers place some sort of sensor. Okay? Here's just a view of a camera with a, a drawing of a camera with a prism block sticking in there. You can see the white light entering and we've got our blue, green, red coming out. And like I said, normally your light wouldn't escape like that. They'd actually collect it with a sensor. Okay, now why red, green, and blue? Well, red, green, and blue are what we call the additive primaries. When we were talking about viewing that blue hat, that was the subtractive color model. Color was being absorbed, absorbed by a pigment or a dye. Um, other things that can absorb are filters. You'll actually use filters, and they use a subtractive color model to go through. But the additive color model is when you're actually mixing light together. Okay, so when, you're actually, when you actually have beams of light and you mix them together, you'll find that blue, green, and red all mixed together in the proper proportions will form white. And you can see that green and red are forming yellow, green and blue are forming cyan, and blue and red are forming magenta. Okay, so cyan, yellow, and magenta may sound familiar with to you because those are the inks that you will find in uh, your inkjet printer. Okay along with black, and we'll talk about that in a second. I just wanted to show you, um, as opposed to that last one that was a graphic, this is actually an experiment that if I was there with you, I would be doing. I would set up the lights and put the uh, different colored gels on them and shine them on a neutrally colored wall. And that's why this one looks a bit, uh, a bit less pristine, but it is actually showing, once again, how those additive uh, colors mix together. And you can see your blue, green, red, your magenta, cyan, and yellow. And in the center, your white. Okay, it's not white, it's uh, uh, light gray, but it is neutral. And, you know, if everything was perfect and there was no loss, it would be white. But just like when you mix paints, if you mix your three subtractive primaries, you should get black, but you don't. You kind of get this dark greenish brown, which is why you always have a black cartridge in your inkjet printer as well. Okay, so back to our prism block, just another little angle there, the light coming through, green coming out here, blue and red. Now, this is actually showing the prism block. I'm going to highlight it in red now. Okay, so this is the prism block, but we're not seeing any light coming out of it. Um, there's probably no light shining into it right now. But what you can see is that we actually have sensors glued where that light would be coming out. Okay, now those sensors can be one of two types for the purposes of the next little bit here. We'll actually call them CCDs. But what's happening with your prism block is you've got your colors and they're being split into red, green, and blue. Okay, now those are the three colors that are going to go to our sensor. Okay, and as I said, in this case I've called them CCDs. I've highlighted them in blue here. And there they are, just stuck onto our prism, prism block. Now, this is a CCD, a charge-coupled device. Okay? And the charge-coupled device is just a way to convert light into electricity. Okay? So you can see it's actually quite small, and your... Uh, your still digital cameras at home actually only have like a one-eighth inch sensor in them uh, if it's a point and shoot. If you've got a bigger SLR, uh, you might uh, have a little more. And even professional video cameras tend to only have one-thirds or two-thirds of an inch chips in them. Okay, so we're, we're talking quite small, quite sensitive. They turn it, uh, the light into electricity. Uh, there will then be a little amplifier and some processing going on. Now, there is another device that's actually being used in quite a few cameras these days as well, and it's a CMOS, okay? It does the same thing in a slightly different way. The science is a bit beyond uh, the scope of what we're talking about today, but CMOS stands for Complementary Metal Oxide Semiconductor. So again, 